But today we have two distinguished scholars, uh, two colleagues, I think almost everybody knows in the discipline. Uh, they've been very successful uh, scholars uh, in their own fields. Uh, Professor Sami uh, in international marketing, international business in general, and Professor Lian Lu in uh, cross-cultural research. Uh, they're both uh, uh, very distinct uh, and, and uh, distinguished in their work. Uh, you, you read their work. Uh, um, among others, they are uh, not just uh, great scholars, but also editors uh, shaping the future research. Uh, in fact, Saeed has been uh, associate editor uh, for Journal of International Business Studies for some time, and Leanne has been editing uh, Journal of Business Research ID uh, stream for some time. Uh, among other accomplishments. So, Saeed and Leanne, we're delighted to have you here, uh, where we will have a chance to look at some current topics and provide some guidance to those of us who are active in research uh, as to, you know, what are the methodological issues that we should be thinking about? How do we get our papers uh, accepted by reviewers? Uh, and how do we become successful in the publishing business? So uh, thank you so much for joining us. Saeed, you're going to start us first. Uh, so I'll let you go. And then we'll have Leanne share her remarks. And then we'll have about 10 minutes or so for some question and answers at the end. So welcome, everybody. Thank you very much, Tamir, for uh, that uh, colorful introduction. I think when it comes to scholarship, I think you have topped the field in many ways and it's a pleasure to be working with you on this uh, on this uh, webinar and uh, I have a limited time and I know Hannah and Tamir will uh, keep me on time as, as we go forward and I'd like to share some ideas uh, about cross-cultural research but before doing that what I'd like to highlight are uh, some uh, fundamental issues that uh, the, that come up that uh, is worth talking about. And uh, then we look at cross-cultural research. Uh, I will discuss some equivalence issues. And then we look at some culture-related issues. And then I will wrap it up with best practices and keeping with Tamir's comments about how to get past the review process and get uh, a manuscript accepted. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, what we encounter are really not methodological issues, even though the discussion today is going to center on methodology um, and, and with, between myself and, and, and Leanne. Uh, the, the sort of the difficulty that oftentimes reviewers and editors face is that the studies that are being submitted are not well motivated theoretically and grounding your motivation into a strong theory, theoretical base is highly recommended. And offering a logic or a rationale why we are studying a particular phenomenon. This is uh, really the setting the stage early in the paper. This should be done very early in the paper so it's very clear what uh, the, uh, the, the study is about. Um, then. Uh, the second issue that, that comes up in terms of uh, uh, issues that reviewers face and editors face is the theoretical framework uh, that is not uh, as strong as it should be. And uh, strong theoretical framework, theoretical footing uh, leads to a stronger study and enhances its validity. Uh, and, and so early on, again, uh, a lot of cross-cultural research was focused on just establishing that there are differences across cultures. And we see less and less of that these days, but still the idea is to explore more general purposes than just simply looking at differences across cultures. Experts in the field uh, suggest that we use multiple cultures. Of course, the minimum is two, but in cross-cultural studies, we'd like to have uh, as many as pertinent, but just as importantly is that the selection of cultures should be theory driven. And this is something that's very frequently lacking, that if two cultures or three or four cultures are designated for investigation, we'd like to see what's driving that. Why are we comparing uh, these three or four 
or, or two, for that matter, cultures. And, and establishing that within a context of theory would give a lot of credence to the publication or to the, to the investigation. Uh, again, another, another uh, trend that we see is when the data are pooled. You know, we have uh, data gathered from two or more cultures, and occasionally we see data that are pooled. And if the data are pooled, which is not a bad thing necessarily in and by itself, what we'd like to see is parallel analyses of individual cultures, so that we have side-by-side -side analyses of both the pooled data and individual culture data. If individual culture data is not going to be shared, uh, then there has to be a strong reasoning for that, and hopefully theoretically driven as well, and that also strengthens the study. In terms of conducting cross-cultural research that is uh, individual and consumer-based, uh, technology has really assisted a great deal. Uh, Amazon Torque, Mechanical Torque, is available in 43 countries, Europe having the widest coverage with 22 markets. Uh, it doesn't help very much. We have to do strategy research or gather corporate data, but it definitely helps with consumer research and makes it very convenient. But what makes it even more convenient is to have a multinational research team that uh, helps out with not only data collection, but uh, also with uh, the possibility of reducing alternative plausible hypotheses. That is, nuances that we may otherwise overlook, but is brought to the team's attention by individuals in different cultures that are pertinent to our project. And again, that pertinence is established through theory. So the team members should be from pertinent cultures that are selected based on theory to start with. The next item, uh, looking at unit of analysis, clarifying that very early in the paper is a must. Uh, it doesn't have to be defined, but it has to be clarified. Uh, again, it shouldn't be tucked away in the third or fourth page of the manuscript, but rather very early on. Uh, the, 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 the well identified and a well articulated unit of analysis can be extremely helpful in uh, getting recognition by reviewers and, and, and editors. Then, in terms of cross cultural research, one thing that uh, we all have to watch out for is establishing equivalence. These are age old, there's not really much that's new in this regard, but many of them are often uh, brushed over or not considered. And the idea is to really make sure that uh, at least it's discussed that uh, we haven't overlooked it in our research project. Uh, the idea is to establish equivalence across both research settings and instrument considerations. So in both categories, there are a set of uh, equi equivalences that we want to make sure that sets the stage uh, and makes the cultures comparison. Temporal, for example, uh, two markets or two cultures may be at different points in time and studying them simultaneously could make sense, but it has to be explained uh, why that is. Um, in marketing, for example, product penetration in one market may be much deeper than another market. In other words, maybe a product might be mature in one market, but maybe just in the introduction phase in another market. So if you're doing a marketing study across these cultures and assessing issues that are going on, uh, we want to make sure that there is a reasoning for comparing them at that point in time. So it, it's not necessarily that they have to be at the same point in time, but rather um, explaining why that is relevant. Market structure equivalence, uh, industry equivalence, uh, in particular, the number of competitors, the dominance of uh, competitors or one or the top five competitors in the market in terms of market shares that they hold, uh, that uh, gives, uh, again, uh, comparison uh, a lot more credence than may otherwise be the case. In terms of research instrument, we want to make sure that the functions that a manager plays is uh, the same across national boundaries and uh, a, a, a product, a function that the product plays uh, across uh, cultures is the same. We want to make sure, particularly with respect to secondary data, that the definition equivalence exists. For example, uh, often unemployment and, uh, and inflation. Uh, they are commonly used universal, uh, but the definitions vary across national boundaries, and we want to make sure that we take that into account. Conceptual equivalence uh, needs to be established. If there's a concept that we're using 
or even a word that we're using that carries different nuances in different cultures, that needs to be established. For example, the word love is uh, universal in many ways, but is frequently used in a country like the United States. And it's hard to, uh, to really, you don't really encounter that very much uh, in, in Japan, in, in the Middle East, in some Nordic countries, Finland, they carry all different meanings. And it's important that we uh, make sure that the concepts that we use in the questionnaire carry the same meanings and the same uh, ideas so that there's comparison uh, that makes sense that, that we compare them across cultures. Stimulus equivalence, the same thing. If you're doing experiments, you want to make sure that the stimuli uh, are fairly standard uh, in terms of how they are viewed across the cultures that are being examined. Recently, I came across a study that uh, had used somewhat different stimuli across two different cultures, but offered no explanation of why, why that is. And, and I think that explanation could have really uh, made the authors a lot more credible than would have otherwise been the case. And of course, measurement equivalence is critical in terms of developing measures statistically that, that are comparable. Uh, we can show uh, measurement invariance, of course, but then we also want to make sure that all the error terms and all are uh, accounted for uh, and things are comparable. Then moving on into uh, what I call sampling process. Uh, if you are doing cross-cultural studies of advertising, for example, we want to make sure that the sample of ads that we draw from one culture are comparable with sample of the ads de derived from the second market or a third market. And this should be established based on media usage, for example, in those markets, so that there is some basis for comparison of cultural differences uh, given the media usage. And in association with that, we also want to make sure that the culture of origin has uh, no or little influence on the outcome. Um, for example, in comparing ads, we want to make sure that the advertising platform wasn't created in New York or London, and we are examining it in Beijing or in Shanghai. And uh, we want to make sure that the advertising is in, uh, ingrown and homegrown uh, rather than uh, driven by uh, command potentially from a different culture. Uh, and of course, there are nuances, uh, like if you're examining local firms, uh, assessing managerial decision-making in, in local firms, we want to make sure that uh, the subsidiaries and divisions of MNC and MNEs are, are excluded uh, because they tend to get mandates and their decision-making processes are driven by, uh, by policies created elsewhere. So this making sure that the culture of origin is, is, uh, is accounted for is, is critical. Another point about cross-cultural research is that a lot of research, as I noted earlier, is driven by establishing uh, cultural differences. And what we really are interested in is trying to see cultural similarities, why they exist, what variables explain the similarities and understanding similarities at a deeper level. And after all, it's these similarities that allow for global planning and standardized planning, whether in marketing or in strategy, uh, to, to occur. So you know, developing an understanding of cultural similarities is actually more important than cultural differences. Then we also want to take into account the relevant dimensions of culture. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, increasingly uh, been, is being stressed. I know in the Journal of International Business Studies, we look at this very closely. Uh, there was a study done by Sherd, Google, Dick, Costova, and Roth in 2017, in which they examined uh, a variety of published works. And they uh, found that the best use of research is at the aggregate level, as opposed to selecting uh, the, uh, one or two dimensions of hosted as uh, cultural uh, uh, dimensions. So they're lucky to use it as a, as a whole, as complete, because you're looking at the entire culture as opposed to just one narrow sliver of, of, of cultural influences. And others too, they, they have stressed this, that, that we need to go beyond hosted as uh, national culture framework 
to look at other types of measures as well. Then uh, what I'd like to discuss is the methodology checklist limitations. Yeah, obviously there are a lot of nuances and I know I'm going over these rather quickly. So feel free to ask questions once we are in the question and answer section. Um, we, as a matter of practice, I think it's really helpful in cross-cultural studies and maybe in all studies to develop a set of checklists and basically check off every item that needs to be looked into. It doesn't mean that it necessarily needs to be discussed in detail in the paper, but at least you know that you have watched out for it. And then of course, this can add, be added to the limitation section, why we didn't look at this or what's the implication of something that we did not look at or we did not consider. And this sort of proactively tells the editor and reviewers that, yeah, we are cognizant of this, but for this and that reason, uh, we, we think this is, uh, uh, this is robust and this works. So this cultural, this, this list can be, uh, can be very, very helpful. And also uh, in, in terms of uh, the, uh, the paper itself, we wanna make sure that there is full transparency that there is full disclosure of all the details, particularly with respect to methodology. Very frequently, we can encounter missing information that's critical to our understanding at the review end and at the editor's end uh, to, to know exactly how this research has evolved. Where do the details come from? And providing that level of fine-grained detail is, is really important. And I encourage everyone to really pursue that. Uh, there's always an opportunity to cut back, but, uh, but it's too late if it's not in there when the paper is being reviewed. Uh, then another piece that's recently come out and I wanna bring everyone's attention to is data access and research transparency. And that uh, is going to be a, a very uh, increasingly a critical issue that's going to be attended to and probably required in many respects going forward. The idea is that uh, we can not have databases that generate hypotheses, that hypotheses should actually precede data collection as we are often taught. Uh, and for that reason, in experiments in particular, uh, pre-registration is uh, going to be increasingly a requirement. It is not yet at GIPS, but I think in some other journals it is. And uh, the Center for Open Science is where uh, experiments would be registered. Again, this is a vehicle for researchers to know that you had a theory, you had hypotheses, you gathered data, and the hypothesis either panned or did not pan out. And so it gives a lot more credibility to the published work. And so uh, this, this is something that's, that's forthcoming. And with that, what I'd like to do is turn your attention to uh, a call for papers that uh, will soon be coming out. So you're actually getting an advanced look at this special issue, business model innovations in a disruptive global environment, or this is from an international marketing perspective with deadline in June, 2021. And I wanna encourage everyone to try to submit something to the special issue. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to share these ideas with you. And I look forward to your questions and answers. I will continue with Saeed's discussion about challenges in cross-cultural research and the need for multiple methods. Then I will give two quick examples of incorporating micro-networks and text analysis in IB research. And uh, then we, will, we can talk about, um, we'll talk about some new development in text analysis. Um, so this, this figure from a, a book chapter by Michelle Gelfin and her colleagues shows that um, just as Said said earlier, uh, cultural, the cultural values and cultural norms um, complicate every step of our research uh, project from the research question to the samples to uh, assess the constructs and choosing method, every step is complicated uh, by cultural diversity, the differences in perceptions, in norms and values, um, which is why a single method may not be able to address um, these complexities. And so using multiple methods and multiple sources of data can help us 
uh, triangulate and add improve validity, um, reliability, and add confidence in our findings. Um, of course, there are many, many different, different methods that we can use um, to achieve this goal. For example, we can use uh, electro, um, econometric modeling or simulations that can also achieve this goal. Uh, but here I will provide two quick examples about using uh, micro network and text analysis. Uh, sort of in addition to more uh, traditional methods uh, that we use in cross-cultural research. Uh, this example, uh, Said is so modest, uh, he didn't mention his own paper, so I'm going to use my own uh, papers to illustrate, to give you the quick examples on using this method. Um, there's one, uh, so the first example is that we are interested in mental models, how we think of things, the holistic conceptual cognitive network and the role of mental models in intercultural and intercultural negotiations. Um, this uh, figure shows that when we, the cartoon shows the cat think about the ball, the table and the ground and how to get the ball off the table. Um, think, but when we think about the world, um, every specific situation, we actually think of things in spatial relationships and uh, even time space continuum. Um, so, but how do we measure a negotiator's mental model? Um, so we can use um, from cognitive psychology and some previous research about teamwork. Um, we can use concept maps to measure mental model, how we think of things are related to each other. Um, this one shows um, that when we communicate, the whole picture uh, may not be exactly transferred. There are definitely information lost in, trans in translation, in communication. Um, so how do we measure the consensus, the degree of consensus that the two mental models match? Um, again, in the negotiation setting, um, there are ways we can use network analysis um, to do to achieve this. Um, so in this research um, project, we measured negotiators mental models pre and post negotiation. Um, and, and then use the social network, actually the social network method to um, analyze to um, to look at the con the convergence um, in uh, two parties negotiation negotiators mental model. Uh, basically, it's a it's a matrix um, that about the different elements in the negotiators mental model. So we had pilot tests to set the elements and then give everyone a matrix to measure their mental models. Um, in, in addition to established measures, for example, we use the Schwartz value survey to measure individuals' culture, um, cultural values. And then um, in, in multiple experiment, negotiation experiments, that's very much like psychology experiments. Uh, so in addition to the micro method, um, this study we find that um, culture individual mental model change um, has this, there, first of all, there are different pathways to, re, to reach joint outcome in negotiations, in intercultural versus intercultural negotiations. Before this study, most research have found that cultural differences is a barrier. Intercultural negotiators often achieve less um, subjective and objective outcomes. Um, but this study, we show that it's, it does not necessarily to be the case in inter, because in intercultural negotiations, individual mental model change actually have a positive impact on the joint outcome. 
So this study, if we did not use the network, micro networks to measure the mental models, we wouldn't have found that um, cultural differences does not have to be a barrier. Um, actually, cultural differences offers opportunities for mental model change, for openness, for adaptation that's beneficial to the joint outcomes. So that's one example that we use the micro networks in cross-cultural study. Um, the second example I'm going to show is that we want to study um, metaphors in international joint ventures because these examples shows that the media in or in corporate report, we constantly see metaphorical um, metaphorical language that describe inter international joint ventures. So we want to study, does the metaphorical language make a difference on the outcomes of international joint ventures? Um, so we, again, we use the three studies. It's, it's a combination of um, uh, language comparison um, and then interviews. And then um, the last study is a longitudinal study of news report and corporate report. Uh, we use the both human coding and um, text analysis methods um, to analyze the data. Um, so this is the model that we find. Theoretically, we think that the expression, the metaphorical language reflects semantic fit, which means the cognitive perceptions on how the international joint ventures uh, partners treat each other. So in this study, uh, we had, it's a, again, a combination of qualitative and quantitative data. In the third study, especially when we coded thousands of uh, uh, newspaper articles, we used the human coding, um, and then we used the text analysis software called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count. Uh, that's one of the text analysis um, software um, that can help us with the data analysis. So this study, um, I won't go into the details, but you're welcome to read the paper and ask questions uh, later. So this one, we use the combination of text analysis. Um, there are, of course, other tools for computer-aided text analysis. Um, this um, table, again, shows their pros and cons, and the capabilities of each tool um, can help in analyze the types of data. Um, because and this it doesn't show like R, which in a minute I will show some examples. Um, for example, and vivo is a very powerful tool. Um, it can cover methods in seven languages, um, and also audio audio files that can help us um, um, analyze the data and linguistic inquiry and word count can also be used to test, uh, for example, language style matching, um, which we think that also reflects the cognitive um, structures and mental models uh, between two parties in the expressions and text. So given the current, um, the availability of all kinds, these tools, um, plus the big data, all kinds of text, um, text that's available, uh, there are lots of potentials to do research in this area. Um, there's another two, I'll just give you an example that's sort of like a network of text. Uh, so there's a, t in the package R, there's a um, um, side package called tidy text mining. It shows, for example, this one shows word networks in like article titles. Uh, this is one example. Here's another example shows word networks in descriptions. And um, the end on the right shows like the number of times they appear together. 
Um, here's another example about co uh, it's a correlation network in some articles keywords. Um, so these kind of analysis are available in um, different packages. Um, so this one um, on the left side is an example of a sentiment analysis in language. So it shows positive uh, versus negative uh, words. Um, in Python, I believe they have more, um, there's more um, sophisticated ways to look at sentiment, not just the positive and negative uh, words. So uh, for example, um, you can look at media reports about the Belt and Road policies of China and um, look at, then look at the FDI the, for direct investment. Uh, so these are, there are publicly available um, um, information and data that we can use and there are lots of potentials to do research in international business. And then there are new, uh, new developments about available tools such as machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, and um, there are new um, studies about in authenticity analysis in tweeters, uh, so to, or like some celebrity endorsement and to look at how consistent um, they are in the different words, then that's the authenticity analysis. I want to see uh, in machine learning, uh, this article by T. Dar and uh, Eisenhardt, um, just uh, recently published in Strategic Management Journal. It's a combination of uh, machine learning and multiple case study um, about in the, I think it's in the digital economy about the uh, value creation and the value capture of different apps. So it's a good combination. So because machine learning can um, complement multiple, um, multiple case studies um, to, to, in, to sort of identify identify patterns in the larger scale and to delve deeper into the richness of the data. Um, but I want to, I guess I want to caution that um, these tools, they are not perfect and they cannot replace our original ideas. Um, they cannot give you good, interesting, uh, relevant uh, research questions. Um, they certainly do not replace uh, our own intimate um, knowledge um, and uh, um, familiarity with our own data. Uh, so there's, uh, there's the caution about using these tools. Um, I want to um, conclude with um, some of my, re my own recent readings about um, uh, from Zora Neale uh, Hurston. She is a phenomenal uh, anthropologist and writer. Um, she talked about, um, so this quote talked about why they get back to the original root of why do we research? Why do we want to study culture? The book on the right um, by Charles King is about a group, a circle of anthropologists who invented, uh, um, the, who changed and shaped the societal dialogue about race, gender, and social movement. So Zora, um, Zora Neil Hurston is one of them. The other anthropologists uh, featured in the book include Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, and their mentors, uh, Franz Boas. So um, I think um, the discussions about methodologies uh, should always um, bring us back to our original questions about our curiosity, about why do we do, uh, do research? Why do we want to study culture? And uh, 
uh, back to our research questions and the tools and different methodologies uh, should help us answer our questions and not the other way around. So um, let me stop here and uh, I think we'll have time for questions. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Leanne. Thank you, Saeed, also. I mean, it's amazing in a very short period how much you have uh, each covered. And uh, these are, of course, uh, the highlights, but the slides themselves, which will become available to our participants, are also very, very helpful. So as I'm, as I'm listening to you, lots of good advice here. Uh, before we turn to some questions that have come up, I just want to run down a quick uh, few ideas that came to mind in terms of how we become more productive and successful in our intellectual efforts and, and become more published uh, and so on. I think that we all realize uh, from the comments here as well that successful uh, scholarship requires, it's, it's, it's a little bit of art and a little bit of science. Obviously you have to be methodologically competent, good in some you know, basic methods uh, that we have covered today, but there's also art to it too, uh, which comes with practice, but also intellectual thought process. Like the end, the last book that you have recommended, I'm certainly gonna look at it. Uh, you, you emphasize the importance of uh, identifying key questions. You know, uh, a compelling question, if the research that you're doing does not have a compelling question, is not relevant to managers, uh, practitioners, or scholars. It does not answer any major challenge, uh, a deep uh, issue that we are we are discussing. Then, then we're not on the right track. So I think we need to bring both art and science, science, and a quick uh, uh, way uh, to 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 summarize the success factors. I think we have to read, 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 especially read seminal papers. And by that, I mean really taking them apart. How does the author develop the idea? How is the abstract, few, few, first few pages of the introduction have written? How do they intrigue the reader? How do they pull the reader into the, uh, how does the paper evolve uh, in terms of from introduction to the middle part of the paper, to the conclusion and so on? You have to be an inspector uh, and, and really uh, focus on some seminal papers and look at the flow of discussion, how the discussion is structured, the paper is structured, and so on. Also, I think it's very important because research now uh, is, uh, you know, very competitive. Publications are, are, are many, but it's still, you know, few pages available in major journals. So you have to focus, be specialized, in a particular stream of research and be very good. That specialization in a particular stream of research will enable you to answer the right questions that have not been addressed yet, therefore become more successful in your own inquiries. Uh, collaboration is very important, right? It's all about when you look at these seminal papers, you see multiple names. It's not by accident. It's not only enjoyable to collaborate, but also you bring complementary strengths. So each of us is very good in, let's say, theory building, writing, analysis, et cetera. Together, I think we not only motivate ourselves, but also complement our respective strengths and become more successful. And uh, there's a question there about uh, data sources. Uh, how do we get secondary data? Well, that's one thing that has actually, we have seen uh, explode. There's many more uh, uh, sources of secondary data, panel data, either free or for some fee that there is available. So the text analysis you talked about, uh, Leanne, uh, requires some secondary data, right? But it doesn't have to necessarily cost, uh, cost us a lot. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna have a discussion of uh, of uh, the global pandemic and how the Italian, the Italian case, how the Italian individuals, businesses, and the public sector have responded to the pandemic. It will be an interesting case study 
I know Francesca is on this uh, on this panel uh, and she's listening in today. So she's looking at the issue of resilience, right? Mm -hmm. How relevant is resilience uh, in terms of individual level or corporate level or public sector level in terms of coping with major disruptions, major crises? So she can look at, I don't know if she has done this, but she can look at just maybe corporate statements and, and see through text analysis how many times resilience comes up. Or she can look at the public addresses, speeches of the national leaders, and similarly look to see you know, how many times resilience comes up and what it's correlated with, right? So this is just one, one idea where secondary data, I think, comes uh, very, very helpful, very useful. So uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I, I do want to re respond to some of the questions. Uh, so you may want to both uh, talk a little bit about, you know, where ter people turn to uh, for secondary data, Said and Leanne. Uh, in, in your field, what do you see uh, to be very useful, very productive in terms of uh, secondary data? I think let me uh, start on one thing that that I know uh, has become uh, somewhat dominant, at least in a section of uh, market research data. But it's not really at the international level, or at least it hasn't we haven't been able to to sort of uh, carve it out internationally. And that's really uh, social media data, uh, information that you can glean from uh, through social media, Twitter. We have a colleague here at TU that uh, is actually uh, his entire research and really excellent research uh, is based on data that has been uh, essentially come up with uh, to, to Twitter. Uh, and, and of course, increasingly, he's also working with Facebook to, to get that kind of data. Now, here's a question uh, or rather an issue that I would encourage everyone interested uh, or currently using secondary archival data to keep in mind. Um, the, the, the issues that we typically run into um, is that the variables available may not fit perfectly a theoretical or a strong theoretical framework. So trying to force a study to fit archival data, I think it's really a, not a very good start. What we'd really like to see is a good theoretical framework and pertinent measures that fit the data. Now, if that archival data does fit those descriptions, great. And I think, you know, just talking to, to my colleague here, um, I, I, I don't do Twitter data, but I don't use them. And that is one of the main challenges that they face. And of course, journals are increasingly uh, flexible with finding alternative means of looking at things, uh, non-traditional ways. And there's, so there's more acceptance of deviations from, I'm gonna call it the norm, uh, in using archival data. But that's one thing that I would really uh, wanna stress to everyone using archival data to make sure that the first steps of a study, which is the theoretical framework justification for the study, is strong and in place. And then, of course, if you have access to archival data that fits that, that's, that's absolutely great. Mm -hmm. So each type of data, primary, secondary, has its own pros and cons. Uh, that's, that's for sure. Leanne, did you want to yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think, uh, of course, your, the research uh, your question has to be theory driven um, and because with all the explosion of data uh, you can very easily get lost or if it's not theory driven the results in the paper can look very descriptive and not analytical I see that's a lot of the reasons that a lot of that's the reason a lot of papers got rejected mm -hmm. Uh, by journals. Um, so, and then don't be afraid of um, asking difficult questions where there's no apparent answers to measure because you can always find a way to measure. 
um, creatively. For example, use uh, concept map networks or use qualitative data or cases. Um, so I think you have to be theory driven. Um, yeah. Well, well yeah. before you're uh, you're very going good, very good. Candidate. Lots of lots of praise for your comments, by the way, by the participants. Thank you again. Lots of good questions, comments as well. But here's one. Uh, that is kind of interesting uh, by Marcus, who says, how does your own cultural background inform or affect your own research? Uh, so that's, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So where do you, do you bring your own cultural upbringing uh, uh, to, to your research? Does it become helpful? Uh, because I know you have each grown and uh, grown up uh, in multiple, uh, cultures. Uh, you certainly were born in different countries and uh, you're practicing and living in, in, in another country and you have done teaching and research in many countries. So how does that help you become uh, a better researcher? You want to respond to that briefly? Well, I think there is a, uh, it's a good question. Uh, you know, one of course, that, you know, the, the thing that pops to mind is the self-reference criterion that uh, this is something we try to avoid, uh, make sure that, that our way of thinking uh, doesn't influence the, the way we look at the world uh, that may be different. Uh, and then the second thing that comes to mind is, is, is the importance of having a cross-cultural team in doing cross-cultural research. So yes, uh, each of the individuals involved in a cross-cultural team are going to have their own perspectives, but you know, first and foremost, they're scientists. So if they adhere to the scientific requirements of conducting research, uh, then that's that own, one's own culture is going to be less impactful on the outcome. But clearly, you know, we are all product of uh, either one or more cultures, and, and these influences clearly uh, influence our thinking and how we see the world. And so you can't really separate yourself from that, but that's where the multicultural team and just essentially having multiple authors on a team uh, would, uh, would, would avoid pitfalls, basically. Mm -hmm. But best practice is universal, regardless of where you come from. Exactly. There's one set of universal best practices. Leanne, did you want to? Yeah, I think there's a process of realizing how culture influences our own thinking. I guess when I first came to the US as a graduate student, um, my culture might be a liability uh, because I communicate, I write, even I write in English, I wasn't clear. My, the comments from my advisors were often like clear, say more. Uh, why is this like so convoluted writing? Uh, then I realized, oh, because I came from a high context culture. So I'm implicit, I'm indirect. And uh, uh, so that, that was a stage Well, I realized, okay, my culture influenced the way I communicate professionally. Um, but then later on, the longer time you study about culture, um, I think actually studying about culture is therapeutical. Uh, well, I was getting through my own stages of cultural adaptation. I was reading about the, um, riding the waves of culture. Uh, so it, it certainly helps with self-discovery, self-awareness. Um, and then we can look at different cultures. For, we, we can look at the home culture from a different perspective. And I think uh, my uh, work with Betty Fong, I know she's here, uh, to about parochialism is our, is sort of, it's a critical view of the Chinese cultural mindset. Uh, so that's another way of looking at culture. And now I want to expand my horizon uh, to other cultures. I think comparing East culture and Western culture is not enough. Um, I'd like to learn about the Nordic culture. Um, so um, the different sets of values on autonomy, on creativity, on gender equality certainly will enlighten further mm -hmm. learning. Uh, I want to sort of stress uh, important, the importance of Leanne's uh, 
comment about the writing and, and sort of self-reference criterion with regard to, in her case, her culture, in my case, my culture. Uh, and, and I know Tamer would share this sentiment as well. Uh, and I want to sort of extend uh, the Anne's comment by indicating the importance of having your manuscript really carefully gleaned over by a native speaker to make sure that it's really communicating what you intend to communicate in an effective way. And that really can go a long way. This has nothing to do so much with methodology, but maybe it can be added to the list of things to do. Sure. We have a lot of international sure. scholars from different countries, especially with jibs, as you know, Tamer and Diane. Yeah. Yeah. The submissions come from yeah. everywhere. And this is so helpful to have that sort of ironed out uh, before a paper is submitted. It is definitely best practice, isn't it? Uh, Said, uh, maybe you can elaborate just a little bit. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, this recent research indicated that hosted dimensions become really useful and more, uh, I, I guess, uh, accurate to use in, in an aggregate level when they are used together. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mac Nguyen is asking, uh, how can you clarify this? Uh, so are we doing the right, the wrong thing when we look at a single dimension, for example, in our research? Uh, well, I, I don't know that it's uh, the difference is between uh, right or wrong. That wasn't my reading of the editorial. Uh, as I said, uh, this would be, of course, in, in the references that uh, the cyber will send out to the participants. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. But it has to do with providing a full picture of the culture because you cannot just compare. And I think that what they're holding is that you cannot compare just one dimension of culture and conclude that there are cultural differences per se. And if you do, I assume if you do it in a very narrow and very carefully monitored way and we don't overstep the boundaries of generalization, it may be okay. But I think what they're saying is that if there are cultural differences, that it should be across all dimensions of host status culture rather than just one or two. And then beyond that, other researchers have indicated that we should actually go beyond host status measure of culture and employ other uh, methods. And so the, the difficulty is, of course, the commonality and the knowledge of one drives it. And so th there are challenges. And I think um, over time, this is not something that's going to change overnight. I don't think anybody is going to be forbidden from using one or two dimensions of hope status uh, anytime soon. But I think this is what they're looking for, a fuller presentation of all the cultural dimensions. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, this, this editorial in 2017 by Bugle Dick and Costello uh, mm -hmm. and Roth uh, would be in the references. And I think that would shed more light in terms right. of what would my drive Thank you. Thank you. May um, I just add that yeah. I totally agree with Saeed saying about cultural similarity. I think I, I think that's a new frontier for cultural research to resolve conflicts and differences in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about this. Murad asks, uh, you know, limiting bias in coding qualitative data. I mean, apart from using multiple coders, mm -hmm. what else can we do to uh, limit the uh, bias? Uh, if you can respond to that. Um, the machines, the softwares can mm -hmm. actually help because they don't have prejudice. Uh, they don't have um, um, biases. So the, I think that's where the softwares, the machines can help us uh, mm -hmm. to get rid of um, like like your biases while you're coding because in normal coding you look at the misspelling you would probably have a negative perception on someone uh, but machines can overlook that so yeah. that's where the technology can help i think very good thank you both so much i mean you've covered a lot of ground uh, in in a relatively short period of time and, uh, and again, uh, the, the PowerPoints plus the recording of this uh, session will be very helpful to participants. We had over 130 people today with us uh, and I wanna thank them as well. Uh, keep coming back for more.